Hello, um, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, uh, Yaokai 101, Exploring the Thrill of Japanese Folklore. My name is Serena, and I am the program coordinator at the Japan Society of Northern California, and Justin, our intern, will be helping us tonight as well. Founded in 1905, the organization works to advance U.S.-Japan collaboration and understanding between the two countries. We offer a wide range of programs and networking opportunities for people and organizations in the Bay Area with a strong interest in Japan, including speaker events like these, conferences, social events, uh, language classes, and more. If you're interested in learning more about the Japan Society, please visit our website at www.usajapan.org. So our first speaker for today is Professor Michael Dylan Foster, Professor of Japanese and Chair of the Department of East Asia Languages and Cultures at University of California, Davis. On a side note, I took Professor Foster's introduction to Japanese folklore class as a student at UC Davis last winter. And I suggested that the Japan Society host an event about yokai because that was definitely one of the most interesting classes I took during my time there. Uh, so there are over 800 registrants for today, which is a record number for us. So thank you everyone for attending our event and we hope you enjoy it. And one more thing before we begin, we will be having a Q&A session a little later. So feel free to type in your questions in the chat and indicate who your question is for, whether that'll be for uh, Professor Foster, Matthew Meyer or both. And without further ado, let's jump straight in. Please, Professor Foster. Okay, thank you, Serena. I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully everybody can see that now. Uh, first, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Serena, for your kind introduction and for taking my class last, last year. And uh, I wanna thank the, the Japan Society of Northern California, um, particularly uh, Miho Greenberg and Takahide Akiyama for setting all this up and Justin, who I just met today. Uh, this is uh, this is a thrill. I can't believe so many people are visiting from so many different parts to see yokai, and that's just a uh, an indication of the incredible popularity of yokai and how this strange phenomenon that exists everywhere in a sense, but is particularly uh, famous in Japan at, at this moment, has really touched so many people. I also want to say that I'm really happy for this opportunity to work uh, to have this um, presentation today with Matt Meyer whose work I've admired from afar for a very long time, uh, but we've never actually had a chance to meet. So I look forward to having a conversation uh, with Matt afterwards and to hearing his presentation as well. So let me begin. Um, I am, as, as Serena so kindly introduced me, I am a professor of Japanese and currently the chair of the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at uh, UC Davis. Um, but I'm also, uh, I've, I've studied yokai for a long time. Um, more than two decades now. And that's a, kind of a strange thing to study. And I think one thing that, that Matt and I can discuss later is how we both got into this particular subject. I won't bore you with that now, but I'll just get right into the talk. Um, one quick plug, uh, I have written two books on, on yokai. Um, the one on the left, Pandemonium Parade, is very uh, academic in the sense that it's, it's got a lot of kind of cultural history in there uh, for those of you who are really into the details. Um, the one on the right is also academic, of course, but it's also much more introductory. Um, and it's, a, uh, I think, a very good introduction to the subject of yokai and readable for, for people from all different walks of life. So um, I'll, I'll advertise my books there. So, and they're, they're all available uh, very easily. Um, what I want to talk about today is I'm going to start very simply with the question, what are yokai? Um, and I'm not going to completely answer it because it's a hard question to answer. Um, but I'm going to also give you a little bit of the history of, not so much the history of yokai, but the history of the study of yokai um, and the ways in which they've been approached. And I'll have um, some images, some older images, and then uh, with, with Matt's presentation, I think we're going to get to see some really uh, vital newer images. Um, so first of all, what are yokai? Obviously, you're all here because you've heard of yokai um, of some sort. They're considered to be part of Japanese folklore. Um, this is the word yokai, but there's other words that come with this that, that have historically been used. Words like mononoke. Those of you who've read the tale of Genji, perhaps, uh, you wouldn't have come across the word yokai, but you might have seen the word mononoke. The word bakemono. Um, bakemono literally means a thing that changes. And this word was particularly common during the Edo period, uh, the time from 1600 to 1868. 
Um, another word, obake, uh, it's a little more childish maybe, it's, it's the kind of word a kid might use, means the same thing, right? So all of these words somehow in recent years have fallen under the kind of rubric, the kind of catch-all phrase or word yokai. How do we translate it? Uh, there are so many different ways to translate it. Monster is a translation that, that has been used in the past. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, legendary or fantastic creature. Uh, I like that the use of legend here because it relates to Japanese folklore and, and these are creatures that come from folklore for the most part. Spirit, um, that's a little more amorphous, more ephemeral than a monster with a corporeal body. Supernatural phenomenon, that implies a strange thing that occurs with maybe nothing you can see or feel, right? So all of these, it's a very all-encompassing term in some ways. Um, so I think the best way to translate it is yokai. <laughs> so uh, when, when I first wrote my, my first book, it was really hard to know what to call it. Um, you know, to, to use the word yokai or not. So when that book came out, um, the word yokai was not so well known in English. In recent years, it's become much, much more well known. So I think it's very, you know, we can call these things yokai and understand that they encompass this whole large his history as well as all these different phenomena. So what are yokai? How did they come about? This is also a hard question, but I'd like to think about the very particular way in which humans experience the world. If we something happens, there's an event, a feeling, a question, we rationally try to figure out what it is, right? What, what caused that? And when we do that, that leads eventually to an image of an object or a named thing. So we go from this kind of amorphous, ephemeral idea to something more concrete. It's a very basic process, how we approach all sorts of things. Here's one way in which yokai um, are part of that. Here's an image. Um, you can see it's an image with, it's an old beaten up house with uh, eyes coming out of the shoji screen. And, you know, you can imagine traveling at night through the woods and you need a place to stay and you come across this, this beaten up place and you, you crawl in there to, to take a nap and you have a feeling that every, these eyes are watching you. This is that creepy feeling made into an image and actually given a name, in this case, Mokumokude. Uh, I'll come back to this in a little while. So um, it's this idea of emergence of something concrete from something amorphous. We get the same thing with individual yokai. Here's, um, there's an idea called hyakiyagyo. Um, this is an idea of a literally a night procession of a hundred demons. We don't have to take it literally in just a hundred, just a lot of demons, right? It's the idea of a time and a place where things are frightening, where there might be there's chaos. This is what I like to call pande pandemonium, not pandemic, but pandemonium. Uh, the idea of an undifferentiated mass of, of crazy looking creatures and, and mad, terrifying things, right? Here's an example from a text from a, the, the, uh, the, uh, the 13th century, um, uh, what's called a setsuwa. And this describes, I won't go into the backstory, but there's a monk and he's in this, this old temple and he says, and he's hiding there at night, says a crowd, some hundred strong came surging into the temple. When they got close, he saw they were all fantastically weird creatures. There were all sorts of them, some with one, only one eye, some with horns, while their heads were more terrible than words can describe. What I want to note there is just this mass of undifferentiated, not clearly individuated creatures, right? Gradually through time, people started creating an image of what that might look like. This is a picture scroll. It's, it's a, a, an Edo period copy, but it's probably from a 16th century uh, picture scroll, scroll called the Hyakiyagyo uh, pictures uh, scroll. And I'm just gonna scroll through it very quickly. So these were picture scrolls and you, you would literally unroll them and look at all these images. And you can see these massive kind of undifferentiated um, creatures of all different sorts, um, a kind of pandemonium of these creatures. And at the very end, there's, a, there's not really much of a narrative to this, but there is a sunrise at the end. The idea being that perhaps the sunrise will cause all these creatures to scatter. So 
Gradually though, as people told stories about these and, 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 and wanted to get a little more specific, we have an emergence of a, the differentiation between them. We get labeling, we get naming, the, diff, the different yokai are located and this pandemonium, and this is the, the language I like to use, this crazy random pandemonium becomes a parade. It becomes much more ordered. Um, and here's a, another picture scroll a little bit later. This is from the 1700s. Um, and you can see, we also get all these creatures here. But the one difference here is that they're actually, sorry, they're actually labeled, right? So instead of just having this weird little creature called uh, there, we get a name associated with the creature. It's called the hyosube. Right, um, and that's the difference. We get this kind of labeling and they become differentiated from the masses. So this is a process. It doesn't happen at one particular moment in time, but we see it gradually occurring. And there's some more images there. And you can see the same wonderful, creative, fantastic images, but um, differentiated. So we have a lot of abundance and variation. And that's one thing that happens with yokai all the time. So. Uh, one of my favorite yokai is the kappa, a very commonly known water creature. Um, probably a lot of you have run into the kappa, or not literally, or maybe literally, but uh, you, you've, uh, you've read about the kappa, know about it, lives in ponds and waters. It's got webbed hands and webbed feet. It's got a shell on its back, a saucer on its head, pulls water, people and animals into the water. It's, it can be quite disgusting. It'll actually uh, in some narratives, reach up through their anus and yank out their internal organs. So it's, it's a pretty disgusting creature, but it's also charming in some ways. And it's very famous for liking cucumbers. So any of you who, who like sushi and go have a kappa roll or kappa maki at um, a sushi restaurant, that's cucumbers because of the kappa. So the kappa is a great example though of the abundance and variation of yokai. Here's another image from that scroll we saw but there are regional variants of this kappa, the same kind of water creature with different names, Kawataro, Garapa, Enko, Mitsuchi, Dangame, Komahiki, Suiko. There's, there's literally um, tens of thousands of different names. Every community would have had at some point its own local legend and its own local name. Here's an image of a, a variety of those different images you know, what, what they might have looked like, different ways of visualizing the kappa. And now in Japan, there's, there's kappa collectors. People collect all kinds of kappa related items. And as you can see, the kappa, that gross little creature has become a cute little creature, right? This is a clip art kappa that I got um, on, on, online. Um, and uh, here's a kappa used to advertise for some reason a dry cleaners, right? So there's such a variety of them. Another yokai that I happen to like is the tanuki, a shape-shifting yokai. Um, and this is also is very, very, one of the more common yokai in Japan. He's famous for shape-shifting and, and for pounding on his belly. What I like about this yokai is unlike the kappa, it's something you can see in a zoo or in the wild. It's a real animal, but it's a real animal to which has long been affixed historically beliefs. For example, the belief is in particular is that the, this yokai, this tanuki, his scrotum, uh, his genitals are infinitely expandable and can, you can use that for all sorts of shape-shifting things. Here you see some wonderful images of just that. Uh, it's a little hard to see, luckily perhaps, but they're drumming here. They're, uh, they use, uh, they make uh, blankets, all sorts of wonderful transformations. And if those of you in Japan obviously have seen these fun-loving shigaraki um, style uh, tanuki at all sorts of places. So what do people do with this kind of variation? There's just so much of it. So one of the things they do is they collect. Um, and this is, you know, you collect stories, you collect and you classify and you organize and you describe and name. This is what I call the encyclopedic mode, um, a serious way of processing information. At the same time, People tell stories about yokai. They draw them, they play with them, they create them. This is what I call the ludic mode. Ludic just means playful, a lighthearted creative process of expressing information. And these things go together, these things go together. So first the encyclopedic mode, let me show you very quickly um, some encyclopedias. 
This is the Wakan Sansai Zue from the early 1700s. And you can see the way yokai were literally written about in an encyclopedia and described. Uh, there's a picture and there's a description of its habitats and, and, and its proclivities and all of that. The one on the left right there is the Kawatado. That's a version of the kappa we saw. And this is what it says about the size of a 10 year old child. The top of its head can hold a scoop of water. Kawataro usually live in the water and steal melons, so and so. Uh, they uh, people crossing rivers must be very careful, right? So this is what this is the encyclopedic description of this particular creature. The ludic mode, and these again, these existed at the same time. They're sort of part of the same sensibility. The, this is where people play with them. In the uh, late 1700s, there was a a form of book, woodblock print books that were mass produced called kibyoshi. These are the predecessor to modern manga, right? We have images here, it's a little hard to see, but, but these are yokai playing with each other. So it's a playful use of yokai. Here's a kappa right here in the water. A kappa uh, and, and a, a one-eyed uh, demon here, and here a four-eyed demon, he's wearing glasses. So it's kind of making fun of technology actually. Um, so there's a playfulness here. These are not necessarily scary creatures, but they're fun loving creatures. The guy uh, th who sort of popularized a lot of this stuff is a guy named Toriyama Sekien. Uh, and he was an artist and a compiler who created a lot of catalogs at the end of the 1700s. And these are what his catalogs looked like. Uh, here's his version of the kappa right here. And here's his version of the Hyosube we saw a few minutes ago, right? And you can tell how these look literally like encyclopedias. There are catalogs. So they take that same encyclopedic form. They even have a listing here, right? They take that same form, but if we read the descriptions and some of them, not all of them, we realize he was also playing games. So this is the Moku Mokuren we saw before. This is actually what it says. It says, no smoke, no mist remains, a house in which long ago somebody lived has many eyes. It must be the house of somebody who played the game of Go. Now that's not very funny to us, but it might've been interesting to somebody then because the word, the game of Go, Ego, which is a, a, a kind of uh, checkers-like game, one of the formations you can make is called a me. And the word me also means I. So he's to play on words. It may not be all that funny, but he's, he's having fun with this stuff, right? Um, and here, this is actually a board game from the Edo period. It's a, a board game in which every square has really kind of an encyclopedic little description of a creature. Here's a kappa right here. Here's a tanuki right here. Here's a yamabiko. There's all sorts of creatures in there. And that was a board game. So literally people played with them. Um, you know what, I'm just gonna, for the sake of time, skip over the people. But I wanna point out that a lot of people have made the study of yokai viable and that studying yokai through history um, shows us the way different people approach them. So very briefly, this guy Inoue Endio uh, tried to debunk yokai and in the Meiji period as Japan modernized. Uh, this guy Yanagita Kunio is really the founder of folklore studies in Japan. And he understood that whether you believe in them scientifically or not, yokai are an important part of culture. So we should, we should collect them and study them, think about them. Um, we also get a manga artist, Mizuki Shigeru, who's incredibly influential in the late 20th century. Um, so I wanted to end just by noting that yokai are always changing to meet the current moment, right? Um, so yokai are not just a thing of the past and not just a thing of the present, but a thing of the, the future as well. And one great example of that is the amabie, which a lot of you probably have seen. This is a yokai that was popular, it still is during the pandemic, which if you show this to somebody, presumably it will help protect people from the coronavirus. This actually started in uh, 1846 um, with this one instance in which a creature like this emerged from the water and said, a good harvest will continue for six years from the current year. If disease spreads, show a picture of me to those who will fall ill and they will be cured. Because of something that happened in 1846, there was a renewal of this same idea, but of course through Twitter and Instagram and contemporary ways of sharing. And it's incredible creativity involved in this. 
The Japanese government got into the act. They have an official icon version of this to help protect against coronavirus. And there's a commercial aspect to it, of course, as well. Um, this is my favorite, which I'd like to drink uh, when I, next time I get to Japan, is the Amabie IPA. Uh, I haven't had a chance to try it. Maybe, maybe Matt's tried that. I don't know how available it is. But um, so, yokai today, just to sum up. The encyclopedic and ludic modes, I think, are still very relevant. And I think we'll see some of that in Matt's work as well. He's kind of the modern day Toriyama Sekien. Uh, and they're a vibrant part of contemporary culture in Japan and also increasingly part of popular culture throughout the globe. Uh, the very fact that there are hundreds of people here, 436 people watching right now, shows the incredible uh, soft power of, of yokai as a cultural icon and as something, as an idea that is attractive to a lot of people. So finally, conclusion, keep watching because yokai are alive. And on that note, I will hand the screen over to, to Matt Meyer, who is part of the world of living yokai, as it were, <laughs> or he's, he has access to it, let's say. Thank you so much, Professor Foster. That was fascinating, engaging presentation. There's history of the yokai there. Um, I'll introduce our next guest very briefly. So he's probably someone who needs little introduction, but Matthew Myers, perhaps better known online as the Yokai Guy, is an illustrator and folklorist whose illustrated databases feature some of Japan's most intriguing ghosts and monsters. His fourth book, The Fox's Wedding, will be published shortly. And if you'd like to learn more, you can visit his website at yokai.com or support his art over on Patreon. And we'll make sure to include links for both of those in the chat. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen here. And make sure that's up. All right. So yeah, uh, thank you to everyone for, for putting this together, to Miho, to Justin and Serena, uh, and everyone at the Japan Society. Also, thanks, Michael, for, for appearing here with me. It's, it's an honor to, to be here virtually side by side with you. Uh, so since Michael did such an awesome job of uh, just going over the history of yokai, I thought it would be fun to tell you a, a famous story. Uh, and it may not be too well known outside of Japan. Uh, inside of Japan in the yokai community, it's, it's pretty famous. But this is called Ino Mononoke Roku, uh, or in English, you could call it the haunting of Ino Heitaro. Um, so this is a supposedly true account of a haunting that took place in rural Hiroshima prefecture over 270 years ago, almost exactly 272 years ago today. Uh, so these are the main characters of the story. This is Ino Heitaro. Uh, he is a 16 year old samurai. Uh, his parents died young, so he lived in a big villa uh, with his young brother Katsuya, who was only four years old at the time, and their servants. And his neighbor was a sumo wrestler named Gompachi. Uh, the story takes place in the summer of 1749 in Miyoshi, Hiroshima. It's a, a small mountain village, uh, really, really remote and rural. It's, it takes a long time to get there, uh, even today. And it takes place at the foot of Mount Higuma. So one day in early summer, Heitaro and Gompachi got into an argument. What the argument was about is lost to history, but the result was that Gompachi challenged Heitaro to a contest to see which of the two was braver. They decided to climb nearby Mount Higuma at night. Mount Higuma was said to be haunted, and if you climbed it at night, you were sure to encounter evil spirits. They climbed to a cursed boulder called Tatariwa. Neither of them felt scared, so they decided to tell ghost stories. They sat down on a sheet at the foot of the cursed stone, lit candles, and took turns telling stories. However, no yokai appeared. Neither of them felt the slightest bit of fear. When morning came, they climbed back down the mountain, and neither of them could say which one was braver but they had no idea what they awoke that night. It set into motion a series of supernatural encounters that would change their lives. A few weeks passed. Heitaro had forgotten about the argument and the cursed trip to Mount Higuma. It was the first night of the seventh month, which would be August 
13th, according to today's calendar. So this is very, very uh, present time. Keitaro awoke to a bright light pouring into his room from the shoji doors leading into his garden. He tried to open the doors, but they wouldn't budge. Suddenly, a giant's hairy arm reached into the room and grabbed Heitaro, but Heitaro managed to keep his cool. He wriggled free from the giant's grip and grabbed his sword. The giant crawled underneath Heitaro's house, so Heitaro stabbed his sword to the floor over and over again, but the giant got away. Meanwhile, Gompachi was also visited by a yokai. He awoke to see a one-eyed boy moving around in his room, but Gompachi was too terrified to move. The following day, Keitaro visited Gompachi and they discussed what had happened. Both of them said they weren't the least bit afraid. They were samurai and nothing could scare them. Then suddenly the lantern in the room flared up and the flames shot all the way up to the ceiling. Gompachi shrieked, but Heitaro remained calm. That night, as Heitaro laid down to sleep, water began to gush up from inside of his futon. He lay in bed and tried to ignore it, but the water kept rising higher. So he sat up and wait for a bit. Eventually the water all drained away. Heitaro had to sleep in a soaking wet bed and he realized that this was probably going to continue for a long time. The next day, Heitaro was expecting something weird to happen and it wasn't long before the first attack came. An upside down severed woman's head burst into his living room through a mouse hole in the wall. It scrambled from wall to wall on its long black hair. It flicked its tongue and cackled. It hopped up onto Heitaro's knee, then jumped up onto his head and licked him from head to toe. That night, the next attack came. Countless gourds descended on strings from the ceiling. They dropped down closer and closer, barely out of reach of his face, but Heitaro was unfazed. He rolled over and went back to bed. On the fourth day, it got freezing cold. An icy wind blew through the house and froze his tea kettle solid. Keitaro wasn't even able to light a fire to melt the ice. Later on, the papers on his bookshelf sprang to life and began fluttering about the room like butterflies. But Heitaro wasn't scared. He carried on as if it was a normal day. The following day, Gompachi came to visit. While they were discussing the strange events, a big stone with fingers and eyes scurried into the room like a giant crab. Gompachi freaked out and swung his sword, but he couldn't crack the stone. Heitaro was amused. By the following morning, the monster had turned back into an ordinary stone. On the sixth day, a gigantic old woman's head appeared in the woodshed. It blocked the doorway and glared at Heitaro. He took his small sword and stuck it into her forehead. It slid in like jello. The giant head didn't even wince. The next morning, the head had vanished, but Heitaro's sword was floating in midair right where he had left it. Then it fell to the ground with a clang. By now, word began to spread around town about the hauntings at the Eno house. On the seventh day, a shadowy monk rampaged through Heitaro's yard. Some samurai came by to try to slay it. Gompachi stabbed with the spear, but the giant grabbed it and hurled it into Heitaro's house. The spear began flying around the house on its own, stabbing and slashing at the samurai inside. It was too much for them. They panicked and ran back to their homes. Heitaro's extended family had heard of the hauntings. Two uncles stopped by to see if they could help. They tried to come up with a plan of attack. Suddenly, three bales of salt flew into the house hurled by some unseen uh, spirit. They danced about above their heads, spreading salt everywhere. Then a shoe flew into the house. It danced in the air for a while and then flew away, tearing a hole in the door. Heitaro's uncles ran away and didn't come back. On the ninth night, Heitaro's friend Yorayu visited. He offered to lend Heitaro a magnificent katana, which had the power to slay a yokai. Just then, a stone mortar began rolling around the house on its own. It was the perfect chance to demonstrate the sword's power. Yorayu slashed at the stone mortar, but the katana chipped like a worthless toy. Yorayu both failed to slay the monster and ruined a priceless sword. He dropped to his knees, drew his secondary sword, and cut his stomach open. Blood and guts spilled all over the room. Heitaro was shocked and began to wonder if now he would have to commit suicide too. 
After all, it was on his account that Byoru took his life. But before he could decide, he heard a knock at the gate. It was Ryoryu's ghost. It stood outside and wailed and moaned menacingly. Heitaro didn't answer. The ghost whined, Heitaro, why are you so brave? It's really frustrating. The following morning, Ryoryu's body, the bloody mess, the stone mortar, and the ghost all had vanished. On day 10, Heitaro's friend, Sarahachi, came to visit. While they sat and talked, Sadahachi's head cracked open like a giant egg. Out from his head crawled three gooey babies. They squirmed across the floor towards Heitaro. As they got closer, their bodies merged together into one giant baby. Heitaro tried to catch it, but it vanished. Heitaro was annoyed. Ghosts and monsters and slimy babies didn't bother him, but it was another thing altogether to transform his friends. On the 11th day, more family members checked in on Heitaro. Word had spread far and wide of his haunting. They chatted for a while, but when it was time to leave, they discovered that their sword sheets had all vanished. They searched around the house, but could not find them. The family members stormed off. Heitaro grew angry and shouted at the spirits. One of the missing sheets fell from the ceiling. Heitaro began to wonder if the spirits were afraid of him. Then he heard a strange noise in the kitchen. He went to investigate. A mortar, a mortar and pestle were mysteriously grinding on their own. That evening, a young lady stopped by Heitaro's home. She thought he must be scared and lonely and came to keep him company. From out of nowhere, a wooden washtub appeared and began to chase her all around the yard. She shrieked and ran away. She accused Heitaro of pulling a joke on her. He tried to explain, but she just got angry and left. On the 12th day, the protection charms that Heitaro had placed around his house were all defaced. That night, an enormous toad with a rope around its waist leapt out of Heitaro's closet. It jumped onto his belly and glared at him. Heitaro recognized the rope. It was his laundry basket transformed into a toad. He was not in the mood for this nonsense. He gripped the toad's rope tight and went back to sleep. When he woke up the next morning, it had turned back into a laundry basket. On day 13, Heitaro's cook suggested hanging a sacred image in the house for protection. He offered to travel to a temple and borrow a scroll. However, his legs suddenly seized up and he became unable to walk. So instead, Heitaro and his friend Heigoro made the journey. Along the way, there was a flash of bright light and a sound like thunder. A bright red stone hurtled through the sky and struck Heigoro's back. Heigoro was badly hurt and fell to the ground, unable to walk. Heitaro had to carry him home. In the end, nobody got the scroll. On day 14, Heitaro heard a strange noise coming from his shed. When he went to check, he saw that the grindstone was moving all on its own. He filled the mill with unpolished rice and decided to let the spirits do the hard work if they wanted to. He went to bed early, but then something woke him up. An enormous old woman's head materialized on the ceiling. Her long tongue dropped out of her mouth and she licked Heitaro all over. He wasn't scared though, he just rolled over and went back to sleep. On the 15th day, Heitaro heard a funny voice in his living room. It sounded like, knock, knock, over here. It was coming from behind a painting hanging on the wall. Heitaro lifted the painting and out fell the missing sheath from the other day, covered in dust and grime. That night, when Heitaro went to his room to prepare for bed, the floors, walls, and ceiling were covered in glue. There was no place to lay a futon. Heitaro had to sleep sitting up. He glued himself to a pillar to keep from falling over. The next night, the glue was gone, and Heitaro was able to lay out his futon. He was hoping to get a good night's sleep, but during the night, a dozen heads on stakes appeared in his room. They danced on their sticks around Heitaro's bed and pillow, accompanied by strange music, which, which came from nowhere. The 17th day came. A group of friends came to spend the night at Heitaro's house. During the evening, they gathered under a mosquito net. They drank, chatted, and had a good time, when suddenly an eerie shadow was seen in the kitchen. They heard voices and footsteps too. Everyone was terrified and unable to move except for Heitaro. 
He went into the kitchen to see what was going on. Nobody was there. However, a barrel of pickles had been left by the door. Hei was so excited that the spirits had left him a present, but no one else wanted to eat pickles that had been left by Yoko. Then Hei friends noticed their swords had vanished. They searched all over the room. When they looked up, all of their swords were on top of the mosquito net. They grew afraid. They huddled together underneath their futons. A table and an incense stand began to fly around the room. Heitaro's friends covered their eyes and ears with their hands. Some of them started to cry. One of them threw up on another one's face. They decided that they'd had enough. They ran home, leaving Heitaro alone with the spirits once again. On day 18, Heitaro went into his room to discover that all the tatami were missing. On second glance, however, they were just actually hanging upside down from the ceiling with string. That night, a jingling sound was heard in the storeroom, and when the door was opened, a priest staff jumped out and began to fly around the house. A trap maker suggested that Heitaro was the victim of a, of a mischievous tanuki or kitsune. He set up some traps to capture the animal. However, all of the traps were quickly disarmed and thrown up onto Heitaro's roof. When the trap maker saw what had happened, he was terrified. A kitsune or a tanuki would have been too afraid to even approach the traps, so the real culprit must be something far more dangerous. On day 20, a beautiful servant girl was sent from a nearby house to visit Heitaro. She brought a box of bean cakes as a present. Heitaro and the girl chatted for some time. She was so beautiful that Heitaro began to grow suspicious. When it was time for her to leave, Heitaro watched her carefully. As she stepped outside the gate, she faded away. She was a yokai too. Worst of all, the bean cakes she bought actually belonged to Heitaro's neighbor, and he was not happy that they were stolen. Three weeks into Heitaro's haunting, he tried to read a book to clear his mind. A shadow appeared on the wall and the light from his lantern. The shadow was so clear that Heitaro could make out every detail. It looked like a human reading a book out loud. Heitaro tried to read its lips, but he couldn't make out what it was saying. On the 22nd day, Heitaro woke up to the sound of sweeping. His broom was standing on its own and sweeping the house all by itself. Heitaro laughed and thought that this was a useful ghost to have. That night, he was kept awake by a great commotion as if a large number of people were talking loudly nearby. On day 23, Heitaro visited Gonpachi's house. All of the furniture, dishes, cups, and books were scattered about like there had been a big party. Gonpachi was not at home. Heitaro went inside to investigate. The ceiling was sagging into the room. Heitaro poked the ceiling with his sword and it slid back up to where it should be. That evening, a massive beehive appeared above Heitaro's bed. The beehive began blowing colorful bubbles into the room. On the 24th day, a massive butterfly flew into the room and began fluttering around. It split apart into thousands of tiny butterflies, which filled the room. In the evening, Heitaro went to light his lamp to brighten the room. It flared up in a huge burst. Then it transformed into a massive stone lantern. Blue and red flames licked its sides. Shortly afterwards, the lantern and the flames returned to normal. On the 25th day, Heitaro stepped down from his balcony to go into his garden. His foot landed in something soft, cold, and gooey, like mud. It was the belly of a big blue yokai. Heitaro was disgusted, but he kept his composure. On night 26, Heitaro was visited by a woman's head attached to a single arm. She flew into Heitaro's room and glared at him. Then she bounced about on her hand like a pogo stick. Heitaro tried to ignore her, but she jumped up onto him and started petting and pawing at him. On day 27, Heitaro sat down at his, at his writing desk. Even though it was midday, darkness closed in around him like rolling clouds. It became as black as night. Heitaro couldn't even see, let alone write. Then all of a sudden it became blindingly bright. Heitaro still couldn't get any work done. That night, Weird noises were heard all around Heitaro's house. 
Among them was the sound of wooden clappers being struck together and women's laughter. Heitaro sighed and wondered how much longer this would go on. On the 28th day, Heitaro heard shakuhachi being played in the distance. Out of nowhere, a group of monks appeared. They filled Heitaro's yard, his balcony, and every room in his house. All day long, the monks played their ear-piercing flutes. All night long, too. Heitaro just laid in bed and closed his eyes. On the 29th day, the haunting showed no sign of letting up. As Heitaro wondered what kind of surprise the spirits had in store for him today, an evil wind blew into the house. Sparks floated on the wind and spread throughout every room of Heitaro's house. They lodged themselves into every crack and crevice and looked like tiny stars. Luckily, nothing was burned. By the 30th day, news of the bizarre haunting at the Eno house had spread far and wide. As for Heitaro, the strangeness had gone on for so long that he had practically gone, gone used to it. A well-dressed samurai in his 40s came to visit Heitaro. Immediately, Heitaro realized that the man was the source of the haunting. Heitaro grabbed his sword and swore he would cut the man down in a single strike. The samurai vanished. Then a voice came from the ceiling, please put your sword away. Heitaro cooled his head, put his sword away, and waited to see what the spirit's next move would be. The hearth popped open, and a thick puff of smoke billowed into the room. The smoke gathered into the shape of a large head. A boil on its forehead swelled up and burst. Worms sprayed out all over the floor and onto Heitaro. He hated worms, but he kept his calm. Then a pair of eyes sprouted from the wall and glared at Heitaro. A mouth appeared beneath them and laughed at him. Heitaro was approaching his limit when the worms in the head suddenly vanished. Then the mysterious samurai appeared once more and spoke. My name is Sanmoto Gorozaemon. I am a demon lord. Another demon lord named Shinno Akugoro and I had a contest to see who was scarier. We would each scare 100 people and the winner would be the top demon lord. I scared 85 people before you, Heitaro. You would have been my 86, but I could not scare you. Your courage is rare and must be rewarded. Sanmoto Gorozaemon presented Heitaro with a wooden mallet. One day my rival may come for you. If he does, strike a pillar with this mallet and I shall come to your aid. We will defeat Shinno Akugoro together. A spirit of protection appeared beside Heitaro. Then a splendid palanquin appeared and Heitaro's yard was filled with yokai of all shapes and sizes. Sanmoto Gorozaemon climbed into the palanquin and the yokai hoisted it up onto their shoulders. They gathered into a big parade and carried the palanquin off into the night sky, dancing and cavorting as they went. Heitaro watched as the night parade disappeared into the clouds. So that was just one of many versions of this story that have been told. Uh, what I find most fascinating about this story is that historically it's treated like it's a factual record. Yokai stories like this were reported as news in their time rather than just as fantasy stories. They were printed in newspapers as accounts of actual real events. The locations in the story are real. There really are records of a man named Ino Heitaro living in Miyoshi around that time. And his tale really did travel far and wide, it seems, because there are accounts showing that large groups of tourists came from all over Japan to gawk at the site of the haunting. Uh, so many, in fact, that the little village of Miyoshi actually had to pass new laws to deal with the influx of visitors. So even, this, even though the story seems fantastic, there is actually a kernel of truth buried in it. The full record of what actually happened that summer wasn't compiled into a single narrative until decades later after it had been embellished and expanded upon by people all over Japan. There are so many different versions of the tale by so many different authors that scholars are still analyzing the texts, the writing styles, trying to decode the true origins of the tale. Heitaro's hometown of Miyoshi is now home to the Miyoshi Mononoke Museum, uh, which has a great collection of the different versions of his story. And you can go there and compare them yourself. So you can see some of the images that uh, the Miyoshi Museum owns 
uh, here on the screen. So I hope you all enjoyed the story and the artwork. Um, you can see more of my yokai art in any of my books here, uh, as well as on my Patreon page and of course on yokai.com. So uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, back to you guys. Thank you so much, Matthew. <laughs> thank you so much, Matthew. That was great. Um, Heitaro is made of sterner stuff than I am because I think <laughs> I would have crumbled within the first couple of days. So we have a couple of minutes right now. Uh, so we're going to do a little bit of a fireside chat, so to speak. So this is just kind of a chance for Professor Foster and Matthew for you guys to chat and discuss what brought you to the study of yokai and maybe some of the, you know, what, what binds you two together. So if you'd like to share that, we're going to continue collecting questions for the Q&A. So just make sure to type your question into the chat so that we can get it if you'd like it to be considered. Thank you. Off to you two. Great. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, I, let me just begin. I'm, I don't know that we have that much time. So let, why don't we just begin, even though there's no, I'm glad we're actually not sitting by a fire, even though it's a fireside <laughs> yeah, it's chat. Hot for that. Uh, right here in Davis, it's pretty hot. So I, I, I'm glad there's no fires nearby. Um, but I, if, if you don't mind me asking, Matt, how did you get involved in the study and the illustration of yokai? That's funny because I was I was going to ask the exact same question to you. So yeah, um, I can do that. I can answer that one too. <laughs> first, yeah. Um, well, for me, I had been interested in folklore ever since I was a little kid, um, and as I grew up, I became interested in Japan as well. So just to cut a long story to short, uh, I eventually came to Japan, and while I was here, I really kind of got curious about what was the local folklore because. I think everybody had read Lafcadio Hearn at some point, you know, we all knew the story of Yuki Ona and Kappa is pretty internationally famous, but outside of those, there was really very, very little information on yokai uh, at that time, you know, you've got basically a, a hundred year gap between Lafcadio Hearn and, you know, right now, where almost nothing about Japanese folklore was written in the English language. Uh, so when I came here and started looking into it, I was just blown away by how cool the world of yokai was, especially, um, you know, being from an art background, I was looking at it artistically and, you know, I came across these scrolls and paintings and the books by Toriyama Sekian, and that just, it blew my mind how there was this untapped world of amazing illustration and artwork, and, you know, I fell in love with it instantly, and as I realized how cool it was, I thought, man, there's got to be other people out there who would find this as amazing as me, or as I, as I do. So that's when I sort of decided I should, I should introduce some of these, translate and illustrate and put my own touch on them and, and share them because this is, you know, the, yoke, the world of yokai is just too good to go un, untapped in English. So that was like the condensed version. <laughs> uh, but how about you? Like, I mean, you've been writing for a very long time and studying for yokai for over 20 years now. So I'm curious, you, you sort of got in there before the, the modern yokai boom yeah. happened. Yeah, and, and that, it's interesting to hear your story um, in part because I think a lot of, uh, maybe a lot of people watching here and a lot of people that I know, a lot of my students are really into yokai, but they're into it. They've gotten into it through anime, through manga, through games and that sort of thing. And uh, it sounds like your experience was different and, and so was mine. So. Um, my experience with yokai was, or my introduction to yokai, was that I, I lived in Japan as well, uh, working for a few years in, in Kyushu, and I didn't really know that I was interested in folklore at the time, but, but when I returned to the U.S. and I was studying um, in a, for a master's degree in Asian studies at, at University of California, Berkeley, uh, I discovered what folklore was, and I realized that this was, this was where my own passion was 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 the study of folklore and more specifically Japanese folklore and during that time I, I had to uh, write a paper for, for a, a graduate seminar I was taking we had to focus on one particular thing and I just I didn't know what to focus on and and this is a, it's a true story I was uh, I had one of those little tiny um, small refrigerators living in a studio apartment and I, I went to get a beer or something out of the fridge and I noticed on top of the fridge I had this little um, uh, I don't know if you can see it here, this little uh, figure uh, of a kappa. <laughs> and 
I, to this day, do not know where I got this kappa. I assume uh, I got it at a shrine somewhere or somebody gave it to me as a present. I don't know. But I, for the first time, looked at it really closely and started wondering, what is a kappa? What is this? this? As, yeah, exactly. yeah, as Matt said, this is something that people know about. I mean, you know, uh, I knew what kappa maki was. I'd lived in Japan. I heard kappa narratives. But then I started thinking, what is it that compels people to tell stories about something living in the water? Why is this found in one way or another in, all throughout Japan? Why are there similar stories in other countries as well? Um, because yokai, of course, you know, in one sense are confined to Japan, but the idea of yokai under yeah, different words exactly. is, is found throughout the world. And that that sort of blew my mind. And so I started reading about kappa. I wrote a master's thesis about kappa. And while I was doing that master's thesis, I read uh, a bunch of books uh, particularly by a, a guy named Komatsu Kazuhiko, who's a yeah. um, anthropologist and folklorist and really that sort of creator of the modern study of yokai in Japan, uh, contemporary study, and he's still very active. And it was in those books that I first realized that yokai as a word was, was something that pertained to so many different things. And um, I just kept going with that. It was just endlessly fascinating and, uh, uh, Get, it kept unrolling in a lot of different ways. So, so very kind of, in some ways, very similar, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think there's that moment where, you know, everyone who's into yoga, they, they maybe have seen the imagery somewhere and then they look at it and just something snapped and they're like, wait a minute, what is this thing? And then you just have to dive in and the rabbit hole doesn't end. Right, right. And I think that's, that's there's a question about what it is that's at the core of it. And there's so many different answers or so few answers that it keeps keep you going. Um, so I think that that's exactly the, the same kind of thing. Let, let me, can I just ask you a specific, so, so my way of approaching yokai um, was doing a lot of analysis and thinking about it and, and, and writing about it in a certain way. Uh, your one, one of your ways, of course, is you have the, the, the ability to, to draw which uh, and, and illustrate, which I wish I did, but, but I have a question for you, a kind of a double-sided question. One mm -hmm. is, how do you choose what to draw? And then the other aspect of that is when you make an illustration, like the illustrations you just showed us, how do you zero in on the particular moment mm -hmm. that you're going to illustrate? I mean, with Heitaro, for example, there's so many different things that occurs. How do you choose which moment in each day for you to show to us? Well, so with Heitaro, it's easy because the story is essentially a picture book already. Um, you know, it was recorded down in those in those scrolls that you saw at the end of my presentation. So there's already a lot of imagery out there. So it, for a lot of those images, it was just sort of um, recreating the scene in my head. So, you know, I'm, in my studio, I created like a little model of Heitaro's house and, you know, little versions of the, the creatures and just placed them in the right location to make the images. Um, but yeah, for me, it starts visually, um, just, you know, having my, my art background and, and illustration background. Um, a lot of my interest in Japan entirely just stems from illustration and artwork. So, um, you know, yokai is such a visual world that uh, when, when I'm looking for new yokai to do, often I'll, I'll page through my books of, of yokai illustrations, um, look at pictures of old scrolls. And if something catches my eye and I just think, I need to know what this is, even if it's just a picture with a name, or sometimes there's not even a name. And I have to go looking through catalogs to find other copies of that image and hope that someone 100 years ago or 200 years ago slapped the name on it, that I can uh, you know, do some research on it. Uh, I also use Komatsu Kazuhiko's library extensively to look for you know, the origins of these creatures. Um, and I think- Matt, Matt and Michael. I'm going to hop in real quick if I can, oh, sure. just so we can get some questions in from the sure. audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of questions and I'm so sorry. I only have to pick a couple because they're really good, but both uh, Michael and Matt have agreed to stay on after the lectures ended to try and informally answer some questions. So stick around after we officially close and we'll see how many we can get through if that's all right with you guys. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, so real quick, we're going to try and get people on camera and so they can ask you the question directly. So. We had a question coming from Christopher. Christopher, are you there? And Mio, can you put Christopher on for us? Hello. Hi, Christopher. Hi. Um, 
Yeah, so way back in the 90s, I was the first person to write a guide on uh, Kitsune in English and post it online. Oh, God, that was a mistake. <laughs> but um, the uh, book that uh, I had first got my information from said that there's 13 different types of Kitsune, but didn't actually list them. And I've been spending the last 25 plus years trying to figure out what all 13 types are. Do you guys know anything about this? Do you want to go first, Michael? Um, I, I I don't know. I, I I would just say, you know, that's a perfect example of what I call the encyclopedic mode in the sense that people are literally like, there's this kind, this kind, this kind, you know, it's kind of natural history view of that. I, I don't know offhand what that's referring to specifically. Uh, there are some books, I don't know how well you read Japanese, but there are books, there's a book called uh, Kitsune no Nihonshi, for example, there, there's books on that in, in that in J Japan, focusing specifically on Kitsune that might have that information, but Matt, Matt might have some other uh, information for us. Yeah, so I just spent, you know, I've been working on a book called The Fox's Wedding, and, and so a lot of the past few years, I've been really digging into Kitsune folklore. Um, as far as the number 13, um, I don't know, uh, I've not heard of 13 different types of kitsune, but I have seen numerous classifications of- there are Yako, Genko, Zenko, Tenko. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, the funny thing is that all of these classifications contradict each other. And that's part mm -hmm. of the, the joy of yokai is that everything you read is gonna contradict everything else. Um, so, you know, it's, I think it's really fun to sort of do the encyclopedic method and, and really look into that. I think it's fantastic to read, but you also have to understand that it's it's an impossible task because oh yeah, yeah, everything disagrees with each other. So at some point you have to embrace the contradictions uh, and I'm embrace sorry, the fact I can't that the, hear you. I'm trying the to shift the high is that you I not just that you can't. don't know them, but you can't know them. Yeah, I wound up actually releasing a role playing game based on uh, my research and I'm making a new one, but I want to try to get as much of knowledge as I can of the different types and such. Unfortunately, I've not heard of any 13 types. <laughs> yeah, like I posted in the, the chat, uh, the actual book that I got it from. It, I think it was released in like the 1960s and when I went to look for it, it, it now costs like over $1,000 to buy it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, your question. Good, oh, good luck we in the game. Question. Thanks. We have, yeah, good luck in the game. Thank you. We have, we have a question from Brandon. 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 Oh, so, sorry, uh, I put on Kennedy first. And, uh, Kennedy, uh, go ahead, Kennedy. Yeah. Hi, can you all hear me? Hi, Kennedy, yeah. <laughs> hey there. Um, I have a question for the two of you. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, say, I just got my master's in Japanese studies and want to kind of go forward in, in the folklore area, but I've been really struggling to figure out what to do. So I was wondering if you had any insight regarding um, sort of your paths to get to where you are today, um, academically or otherwise. Um, I, I can go, it's, it's a long story, but I won't bore you all, but, but in, in my case, as, as I mentioned, I, I just sort of discovered, I was interested in Japanese studies and mm -hmm. Asian studies, and uh, I was very much interested in literature, um, but as I did more and more research and, and, and study, I realized I was interested in what's, what's called folklore, um, mm -hmm. and, um, but I will say that, and, and in my case, I decided to continue on after the master's to get a PhD, which is mm -hmm. not a path I would recommend for, for people unless you're really, really into it, right? It's not a very uh, mm -hmm. a necessarily a financially rewarding path. Um, right. And, and, but, uh, but if you, so I think the most important thing if you wanna study Japanese folklore is to have Japanese language and, and, mm -hmm. and culture as much under your belt as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, studying for folklore, there's several places uh, in the U.S. where you can get a Ph.D. in folklore studies. Indiana University mm -hmm. is, is the one I, I used to teach at, and, and there's a mm -hmm. few others. But it's, it's a difficult path, I think, to, if you want to pursue something academically, um, it's often very um, good to think about what, what your end result, your end uh, goal one mm -hmm. should be. And you can study the things that we, we study under the rubric of folklore studies in, uh, you know, in history, in, in, in literature, and in, in anthropology, religious studies. So there's a whole bunch of different paths depending on what you specifically are interested in. So it's a bit of a vague answer, but Matt? 
Well, Michael is definitely um, better qualified than me to talk about anything academic because I'm I'm completely in a different sphere than that. But um, I just want to echo what he said about you know you know you practice your Japanese, get good at Japanese, come to Japan. Um, a lot of the the information you'll find on yokai, it just it simply does not exist in English, and I think that's part of why we do what we do is because we both love this world so much and. Uh, it, it just doesn't exist. So uh, if you're going to study Japanese folklore, um, mm. come to Japan um, okay. and, and get your Japanese skills really good, especially reading. Oh, yeah. No, I understand. And be prepared to take <laughs> the time to do it because it, it will take time, but it's, it's rewarding mm -hmm. and fun, even though uh, it may not be the most economically sensible choice. And, and if, if I can just add you know, one sure. of the reasons, thank for you. example. Thank you so much, Kennedy. One Thank of the reasons Matt's books are so valuable uh, is because there is uh, very little written about this stuff in English still. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot written about this in Japanese, right? So, so uh, again, to, to echo that, you, uh, you know, I hate to say you've got to study for many years to get your Japanese to that level that where you can access these, but that's really the best way at this point. Yeah. Uh, of, of course, you know, Matt, Matt's books uh, are amazing for introducing <laughs> the subject matter, but to go down those wormholes, you've got to get the Japanese. Mm. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Thanks, thank guys. you so much, Kennedy, for your question. Appreciate it. Uh, in an effort to stick to our original timetable, we're going to move on to our closing statement. But again, please stick around afterwards. We'll try and get through some of Thank you, Justin. Uh, start now my closing. And uh, thank you very much. I'm Takahide Akiyama, President of the Japan Society of Northern California. Thank you very much for joining us today in this very interesting event. I am sure that everyone has enjoyed it in this uh, huge audience. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Foster and uh, Matthew, for your very special story about yokai. I must say that we are very fortunate to, to have the two experts on the subject. I'm pleased to say that this event attracted uh, very many uh, participants and uh, it is one of the record numbers uh, over about, you know, I saw uh, 450 people or something. So for that, I would like to congratulate your guys to attract, to, to, um, attract so many people. And also I'm sure that the many people were attracted by Michael and uh, Matthew. And you have, their, you, you have your own strong power to attract uh, people. So thank you very much. And I also thank, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our staff for the effort to arrange this, this event. And thank you also for the audience for your active participation by asking many questions. I know there are many other questions that uh, you, you wanted to hear the answers about. Japan Society of Northern California is a 116 years old organization. And we are committed to advance understanding and the friendship between the US and Japan and we will continue to provide interesting and meaningful events like this one throughout the year, both in culture and art and history on one hand, and technology and innovation and business on the other. Our activities and these events have been made possible with uh, general support from many corporate and individual members. I'm sorry I cannot read out all those names, but I'd just like to Thank you very much. I think uh, you are seeing um, the list of the corporate members and the sponsors. Again, thank you very much. Also, I'd like to thank you for your donations for this event and for the society. Your kind donation means a lot to us. Thank you very much. We'll continue to provide, um, as I said, many events in a variety of interesting areas in the coming months. On Sunday, August 29th, we will have the 32nd US-Japan Friendship Tennis Tournament for anyone at all levels. As of now, we have only a few spots left. So if you are a tennis player and interested in joining and live in the San Francisco Bay Area or just happen to be visiting, please come and join us to have a fun together. You can find more about it on our website at www.usajapan.org. Uh, we also have many uh, interesting events coming up in September and uh, uh, beyond. 
I will be sending you event announcement. So please uh, look for it. We'll be also be sending an event survey shortly. So please take a moment to respond. It is a very, very simple and short survey. So I appreciate your response. With that, I would like to close today's event. Thank you very much again, Michael and Matthew, for your wonderful presentation and talks, and everyone for your participation. Although we formally close the event now, as, as Justin said earlier, uh, Matthew and uh, Michael have kindly agreed to stay on for additional 10 or 15 minutes or so to chat with you and answer uh, questions you may have. So please feel free to stay online if you wish. Otherwise, I hope you will have a wonderful evening or wonderful day for those in Japan and any, anywhere you, you, you are. Thank you very much again. Thank you.